you can go three weeks without food, but only three days without water. However, one sip of the wrong water can kill you in three hours. Welcome to the biology of bad water, part one. In a survival scenario, nothing is more critical or more treacherous than finding safe hydration. Picture this, you've been hiking for days, you're dehydrated, exhausted. You come to a fork, to your left, a crystal clear stream babbling over smooth rocks looking like it came straight from a bottled water commercial. To your right, a stagnant, muddy puddle, brown and uninviting. The choice seems obvious, but that choice, that assumption, is one of the deadliest mistakes you can make. What you're looking at is the difference in turbidity. Turbidity is simply the measure of cloudiness in a fluid. The muddy puddle has high turbidity. It's full of suspended dirt and silt. The clear stream has low turbidity, and that's where the trap is sprung. We call it the clear water fallacy. Your instincts scream that clear equals clean, but the most lethal threats in water are microscopic. They don't make the water cloudy. That pristine stream can be a paradise for pathogens, while the muddy puddle might just be muddy. The clarity lowers your guard, makes you complacent, and in the wild, complacency kills. In this series, we're going to dissect the three invisible enemies that turn this life-giving liquid into a deadly poison. Our first adversary is a group I call the Giants. These are the lumbering brutes of the microscopic world. Things like Giardia, Lamblia, or Escherichia coli, better known as E. coli. They're the microscopic monsters that haunt a survivor's nightmares. Now we call them Giants not because they're large to us, but relative to the other invisible enemies. They range in size from one to 10 microns. To put that in perspective, a single human hair is about 70 microns wide. So they're small, but in their world, they are colossal. An infection from one of these giants is a brutal, debilitating affair. We're talking about violent diarrhea, crippling stomach cramps, vomiting, and severe dehydration. In a hospital, it's a miserable experience. In the back country, miles from help, that level of fluid loss is a death sentence. They are the most common threat, the frontline enemy you will almost certainly encounter when you source water from the wild. Understanding how to defeat them is the first fundamental step to survival. So how do we stop these giants from invading our system? The most common tool in a modern survivor's pack is the mechanical filter. Brands like Sawyer and LifeStraw have become ubiquitous and for good reason. They work on a very simple, very effective principle, size exclusion. Imagine you have a soccer net and you're trying to force a basketball through it. It's not gonna happen. The basketball is physically too large to pass through the holes in the net. That's precisely how these filters operate. Inside them is a membrane filled with microscopic pores typically around 0.1 to 0.2 microns in diameter. Remember the size of our giants, one to 10 microns. When contaminated water is forced through this membrane, the water molecules slip right through, but the bacteria and protozoa, our basketballs, are physically blocked. They get stuck on one side of the membrane, unable to pass through the smaller holes. It's a brilliant and effective piece of physics a fortress wall that keeps the giants at bay, delivering clean, drinkable water out the other side. It's a frontline defense that has saved countless lives. But this is where a dangerous overconfidence sets in. People see these filters as magical wands. They push dirty water in one end, see clean water come out the other, and they put their absolute faith in that process. They believe that little plastic tube is an impenetrable shield against anything and everything that could possibly be in the water. They trust it so completely that they stop thinking critically about their water source or the limitations of their equipment. This over-reliance is a critical failure point in many survival plants. The filter becomes a security blanket, but it's a blanket full of holes they can't see. They believe it stops everything. It doesn't. They work incredibly well against one specific type of enemy, the larger pathogens. But war is never fought on a single front. Mechanical filters are fantastic goalies against these giants. But what happens when the enemy is smaller than the holes in the net? 
When the enemy is microscopic like a virus, your expensive water filter becomes nothing more than a pasta strainer trying to hold back sand. We're not talking about bacteria or protozoa anymore. This is enemy number two, the sneaks. Viruses like rotavirus and hepatitis A. The scale here is what matters. Your standard backcountry filter has a pore size of about 0.1 microns. That sounds small, but the virus you're trying to stop is five times smaller, clocking in at 0.02 microns. Let that sink in. Picture a tiny glass marble. Now picture a chain link fence. You see the problem. That marble, your virus, doesn't even touch the sides as it sails right on through. All that gear, all that money spent, becomes a stage prop. It gives you a false sense of security, and in a survival situation, that is the deadliest trap of all. Your barrier is a welcome mat for an invisible invader that will shut your body down from the inside out. This brings us to a critical distinction, one that can mean life or death. Filtering is not purifying. Filtration is a physical process, a sieve. It works on the big stuff. Purification is an absolute process. It means rendering the water sterile and safe from all biological threats, including the sneaks. To neutralize these microscopic intruders, you have to go to war on their level. This isn't a job for a physical barrier. It's a job for chemical warfare. Iodine tablets. Chlorine dioxide drops. These change the very chemistry of the water, making it hostile territory. Another weapon is directed energy. A portable UV light sterilizer is a surgical strike. It scrambles the DNA of these pathogens so they can't replicate. They're still in the water, but they're neutered, harmless. Imagine that filter failing, the virus passing through then a flash of unseen light zaps it, rendering it inert. And of course, there's the old way, brute force. A rolling boil will tear their proteins apart, killing them dead. But even if you've dealt with the bacteria and the viruses, there's another enemy. When you can't see, can't taste, and can't boil away. I call them the ghosts. These are the chemical contaminants, the heavy metals from industry, the pesticides from agriculture. These aren't particles floating in the water that a filter can catch. They are dissolved solids. On a molecular level, they have become one with the water. Think of it like salt dissolved in the ocean. You can't filter it out with a coffee filter. The chemicals aren't in the water. They are the water. They flow where it flows, they pass through every pore your filter has, completely undetected. This is a phantom menace. A clear, cold mountain stream can be a toxic soup. Your senses will not warn you. There is no murky appearance, no foul smell to alert you to the lead, mercury, or atrazine you're about to put in your body. So where do they come from? They bleed into the ecosystem from our own world. Agricultural runoff carries a payload of herbicides and insecticides from fields miles away, seeping into the groundwater table. Industrial waste, carelessly dumped or leaching from old sites, poisons entire watersheds for generations. You can see the tragic scene play out. A survivor, weeks into a collapse, finally finds a creek. They're smart. They know about pathogens. They build a fire, get a pot to a rolling boil, and let it cool. They drink, confident in their knowledge, thinking they've made that water pure. But they are wrong, dangerously wrong. That water is laced with chemical ghosts from a farm 10 miles upstream. Boiling doesn't touch them. In fact, as the clean H2O turns to steam and evaporates, the concentration of those dissolved poisons actually increases. You're not cleaning the water, you're making a stronger dose of the very thing that will kill you slowly. Boiling might kill the living threats, but against these chemical ghosts, adding heat actually makes the poison stronger. By boiling water that is contaminated with heavy metals or pesticides, you are simply evaporating the pure H2O and leaving a more concentrated toxic sludge behind. Picture it in your mind a steel pot over a fire. Inside, water from a questionable stream. 
you think boiling makes it safe. You watch the steam rise. That's pure water escaping into the air. But what's left behind? The lead, the mercury, the runoff from some farm miles upstream. We call these the ghosts. They don't boil away. They stay. And as the water level drops, these invisible poisons get crowded closer and closer together. The water you're left with isn't purified. It's an enriched poison. You've performed distillation in reverse. Instead of capturing the clean steam, you've willingly chosen to drink the toxic leftovers. This is a fatal mistake born from a half-truth. Boiling kills germs, but it does nothing for the chemical threats. In fact, it makes them much, much worse. So how do you fight these ghosts? Not with heat, not with a simple screen. You fight them with chemistry. The solution is called adsorption. The tool is activated carbon. Think of a piece of charcoal, but on a microscopic level, it's not a solid block. It's a vast, cavernous maze of tunnels and pores. A single gram of this material can have the surface area of a football field. When contaminated water flows through it, the ghosts aren't physically blocked like debris in a screen. They are chemically seized. The carbon atoms on the surface have a powerful attraction to these organic compounds and heavy metals. It's a molecular magnet. It latches onto them, pulling them out of the water and binding them permanently to its surface. This is not mechanical filtering. This is a chemical trap. The ghosts check in, but they don't check out. That's how you remove the poison that boiling only makes stronger. Relying on one method is gambling. Survival is about stacking the odds in your favor. That's why we follow the redundancy rule, the ultimate protocol. It's a three-layer defense system. Step one, pre-filter. This is your first crude line of defense. Use a bandana, a t-shirt, anything to get the big stuff out. The mud, the grit, the leaf litter. You do this to protect your real equipment from getting clogged and failing when you need it most. Step two, microfilter. Now you target the giants. These are the microscopic bugs, the protozoa like Giardia and Cryptosporidium, and the bacteria like E. coli. A quality microfilter is a physical barrier with pores so small that these organisms simply cannot pass through. They are stopped cold. But this barrier is useless against the smallest threats. Step three, purify and absorb. This is the final kill zone. Here, you deal with the sneaks, the viruses, which are often small enough to slip through a microfilter. You kill them with chemical purification tablets or a UV light. And then, for the final blow, you address the ghosts. You run that water through an activated carbon element. This final step traps the pesticides, the heavy metals, the industrial runoff that the other two layers ignored. Pre-filter, micro-filter, purify and absorb. Three steps, no compromise. Look at the system. Each step covers the weakness of the one before it. It's a chain of security where every link is vital. This is how you walk up to a murky stream and, with knowledge and procedure, produce crystal clear, safe, life-giving water. There is no fear. There is only process. There is only understanding. The untrained person sees a puddle and hopes for the best. The survivor sees a biological and chemical problem set and calmly applies the solution. You are no longer at the mercy of your environment. You are its master because you understand its hidden rules. You can drink with confidence, not from luck, but from certainty. In the end, survival isn't about having the most expensive gear. It's about understanding the invisible biology that wants to kill you.